Welcome to the research labs of Better. Today we're taking a look of two of our test subjects. Martin has asked Julie on a first date. Let's take a look. Hey, I am so excited to see this movie. I've heard so much about it. I love you. Okay. Too soon. Let's see what it looks like with Better. Hey, I am so excited to see this movie. I've heard so much about it. Me too. When life hands you choices, choose better. Well, good morning, everyone. I am Pastor Aaron, and I'm so glad you're all here on this 4th of July weekend to join us for our new series, Better. When life hands you choices, choose better. Why? Because better is just better. So we're going to follow our young couple here for the next few weeks and learn some do's and don'ts. So some of you who are single, you might want to take some notes on just the intro video. I don't think I, I, I've watched them all, and I don't think I made any of these mistakes when I was dating, but I probably did. But um, it's summertime, as we all know, um, and the summertime's weird. For me, it always feels like the end of the year. Like June, July always feels like the end of the year because, I mean, yeah, it was 19 years ago since I was in high school. And for school, you, you go from school from September to June or July, and the year is over. And that's always felt like the end of the year, no matter that it's only the seventh month. July has always been the end of the year for me. Yes, I said 19 years, and I couldn't believe next year's 20. It's crazy. But so I looked at the, I was like, you know, end of the year, you've got that feeling. The year starts back up in September. Most people take the summer, and it's kind of this, this uh, pause on life, we go out and you do some fun activities, you do some fun things, and life kicks back up in September. It starts new. So what happens in January when life's new? We all make our little list. This year I'm going to do this. This year I'm going to be better here. This year I'm going to be a new me. And about February, at least if you're me, those go out the door. And now here it is July, and I'm like, man, it's been four months since I've done any of my resolutions. But this summer, we're going to take it as a chance to re-kickstart re our year, start September off new and better. So we're going to look at the word better. We're going to look at the word better in multiple places throughout the Bible where it says choose better, and better is this, so we can put some better in our life and put it to work. Because there's bad, there's good, but sometimes the Bible says there's better. So our main scripture for today is out of Proverbs 22.1. And it says in Proverbs 22, 1, and it'll be on the screen, a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Silver and gold, I want you to think not just money, I want you to think possessions, material things, uh, status, popularity, um, all of those wants and, and, and needs and gotta haves in life. The Bible says a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver and gold. When you were in uh, Sunday school, for those of you who went, you remember you used to have memory verses? And what happened? Every week you went to the class and you memorized the memory verse, and the next week you'd come in and you'd say, Teacher, I remember my memory verse. Can I tell you for my candy? <laughs> and you would tell them your memory verse, and you'd be like, oh, I got my candy. We're going to do that this summer. We're going to have a memory verse each week. So, Dennis, you can put it back up. And next Sunday, between 9 a.m. and 10 a.m., if you find Miss Charity and Pastor Charity, and you tell her, Mr. Miss Charity, a good name is more desirable than great riches to be esteemed as better than silver or gold, Proverbs 22.1, she's going to hand you candy. Because we want you not just to hear the word, we want you to get it in you. We want you to memorize the word. We want it to get ingrained inside you. And so this is a fun way to do it. So I need you to practice with me because you've got your bulletins and it's in your bulletin and it's got your notes as well in the bulletin and it's got your scripture, but you can't bring your bulletin next week and read it. You've got to memorize it. So let's try it all together one time. A good name is more desirable than great riches to be esteemed is better than silver and gold. All right, one more time. See, we got this. A good name is more desirable than great riches 
to be esteemed is better than silver or gold. All right, you think you got it? All right, take it off the screen. All right, ready? A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. See, look at that. Now, you got to memorize it, and you got to bring it back next week, and she's got a bag of fun candy next Sunday. That's how this works. So, before we go any further, let's take a moment and let's just pray that God is here. Dear God, we pray that you be, your presence be in this room, that you make our minds, our ears, and our hearts ready for your message. Let it impact us, let it move us, change us, and rewire our insides to be a little bit better than we were when we came in. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we're going to talk about today's subject is a good name. It's an odd subject for me because... Most of my young life, I didn't go by the name Aaron. Aaron is my given name. But in my household, my younger brother, um, I got lectured yesterday from my mom and, and my wife on the story because I could never remember where it comes from. He couldn't say Aaron, so he said Nene, Nene, Nene. <laughs> so my elementary, junior high life, I have been called Nene at home. <laughs> Nay for short. Everywhere I went around the house, my brothers call it to me, my parents call it, they call me Nene. They're all laughing. I know, it's weird, but hey, it's me. So I was called Nene. Then I went to school in fourth grade, and our teacher said, well, what do you want on your, uh, on your name tag? And I said, well, could we do nicknames? She says, well, what's your nickname? I said, well, at this time in my life, I had hair. I had gorgeous hair. I had wonderful, full just amazing, everyone was jealous of hair, and it was in a spike. It was short here, tall on the top. It was fantastic. It was fantastic. Everyone was jealous of it on the playground. I was fourth grade, and all those sixth grade girls loved me because I had such amazing hair. So everyone kind of started saying, hey, Spike, hey, Spike, hey, Spike. So in fourth grade, I got written on my name tag, Spike. In fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, I was not Aaron, I was Spike. So at home, I'm Nene. At school, I'm Spike. The only place I'm called Aaron is at church, but most of the time I'm called, hey, Brother Phil's son, because <laughs> the three of us, my, I have an older brother and a younger brother, and the younger brother and I are really close in age, and we kind of look alike, and so nobody knew who I was, and so most of the time it was Sean. Um, that's what I got called a lot, because that's my brother's name. And the funny thing about that is I'm 38, he's 36. I have known people all 38 years of my life, and I will go to a church where my brother is, and he serves on a team there, and I have known these people my entire life. Maybe they haven't seen me for a year or two, and I'll walk up, and I'll be like, hey, how's it going? They're like, good, Sean, how are you? <sighs> I'm Aaron, but thanks anyways. Sometimes I just play it off. I'm good, man, good to see you. And I just act like he would. My fun part is when I go to church there, there are people who know him really well, and they've never met me. And I'll stand across the room, and they'll be way in the other side of the entranceway, and you can see them going, I think that's Sean. Is that Sean? I think that's Sean. Wait, that's not Sean's wife. Who is that? Because I'll be with Charity. <laughs> so you'll see them puzzling it through their head. Is, is, that, is that Aaron? Is, is that Chair Sean? And if it's Sean, that's not Kim. Did he bring another woman to church? How did, where's Kim? I need to go tell Kim. It's, I feel bad for them, but I still laugh because it's hilarious. I get... I've been with his wife over there, and then they'll come up, hey, Sean and Kim, how are the kids? I don't know. Why would I know? <laughs> just, just to mess with them. So I've had this name identity issue, and it's, it's funny. Um, my mom still calls me Nay. My brother, when we go golfing, ah, oh, good shot, Nay. And I'm like, there's people around, don't do that. <laughs> but it's just my name. I've kind of gotten used to it. My wife, not a big fan of it. But it's better than when my mom calls me Aaron Matthew. Because we all know when the two names get put together, you're in deep doo-doo. So a good name is important, right? A good name is more desirable than great riches, and to be esteemed is better than silver and gold. Better than Arnold. Lorianne, if she was here, she would be saying amen to this, because when you call her Lorraine in her wedding, <laughs> you are bound to be called Arnold to this day. Tell, tell Arnold I said hi. Yes, ma'am. 
So a name. I want you to make sure we understand name. Some, I'm studying Hebrew, so I asked my rabbi this week. In Proverbs, which is in the Old Testament, in the original Hebrew, talk to me about the word name. He said the word name is just not name. It's just not Aaron. It is reputation. It is the story the name says. There's a lot more to it. So don't just think, well, my name is Aaron, and that's not really cool. It would be better if it was like Trevor. No, we're talking about a good reputation. Um, so a good name is what you're known for. So let me ask you, what are you known for? What does your name say to other people? Some of you in this room instantly thought, my name stands for this. I have built a reputation. When people would say my name, I know it would stand for this. Others of you in this room went, I don't care what other people think about me. I'm going to do me, and they can do themselves. Their opinion of me and my name don't matter. I don't care what they think. Haters are going to hate. I'm going to do me, and they can go worry about themselves. I am who I am, and I don't care what other people think, and whatever thing you see on Facebook posted all the time about what people think. However, the Bible says a good name has value. You should care what people think of when they hear your name. So before you say, I really don't care what people think of me, let's consider having a good name, the value of it. If you look in your Bible in the Old Testament, names have significance. Moses' name is Moses, but it says to the reader, son, or deliver. When they read David, or Dawid, depending on your Hebrew pronunciation. Come on, Cooper, I'm trying to show off the little Hebrew I've learned. <laughs> depending on how you say David, you're reading beloved. So every time somebody reads David in Hebrew, they read beloved. That's what it says to them. Saul, as in King Saul, means the one who was prayed for, the one who was asked for. Names are not just identifiers. They tell you a story about the person. Think about Dances with Wolves, the movie Dances with Wolves. Why was he called Dances by, with Wolves by the Native American tribe? Because they saw him out there with the wolves dancing around. And their names in Native American tribes often said something about them or a characteristic or something they used to do. That's the way names work in the Old Testament. They're trying to tell you something. Now, we don't name our children that same way anymore. We don't think about that. No, not everyone. I, I, I don't. But I went ahead and I found some examples of what some of our names in here mean. So here's a couple of them. Aaron means light bringer, radiating God's light. Mike, Michael means, means esteemed. Juanita means God is gracious. Maya means devout. Kathy means unblemished. Now, none of you run around going, hello, unblemished, good to see you. <laughs> but what you do do is say, hey, Kathy, it's great to see you, or there's Kathy May. And what's the thought that's going in your mind? There's the hugger, there's the lover, there's the giver, there's the sweet, nice person who takes care of all of us. When you say Kathy May, you get this list of identifiers and characteristics. And that's what a good name brings. Names tell a story. They bring reputation. So what if I said I ate off Hitler? Or Billy Graham? Hillary Clinton? <laughs> Donald Trump? Half the room's ready to fight. Martin Luther King Jr.? Osama bin Laden? Mother Teresa? I say those names and instantly it's... You can see them, but then you can think things of them, about them, reputations, stories you've heard. Some, there's impact when their names are said. So the Bible says your name should tell people a good story. It should say something good. So I've got three tips on why a good name is better. A good name is, instills confidence. That's number one in your fill-in-the-blank on your bulletin. A good name instills confidence. Proverbs 10.9 says, whoever walks in integrity walks securely. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely. I'm going to tell you a quick fun story. There's a friend of mine, his name is Jim, and he was a very meticulous neighbor. He was always concerned about not upsetting the people who he lived around. 
So the night his dog was, got out and was gone for a really long time was not very normal. In fact, it was really bad. In his mind, this was the ultimate mistake on his part. But what was worse is that when his dog did come in, he had the neighbor's cat in his mouth. Dead. So Jim laid into his dog. You're a bad dog, bad dog, don't do that dog. But then he thought, what should I do? Do I go tell my neighbors? Or do I clean it up? And he couldn't bring himself to go tell his neighbors and, and level and be honest. So instead he decided to clean it up and leave it on the neighbor's porch. So he took the cat to the bathroom. He washed it four times to get it clean. He took a little hair dryer and he blew dry the white fur and he got it all nice and poofy. And it was really dark outside in the middle of the night, so Jim runs across the street, leaves the cat on the neighbor's porch. He sneaks back home, and then he spends the whole night going, are they going to find out? Are they going to know? Am I, did anybody see me? Am I going to be okay? Next morning, Jim goes to get his paper, and the neighbor's like, hey, Jim. And he's like, hi. Um, hey, how's it going? He's like, man, you know, I'm doing good, but something really weird happened last night, Jim. Jim starts sweating. His heart starts to beat. He knows. Jim's like, oh, really, what happened? Well, Jim, yesterday our cat died. We had a funeral. We brought the kids. We did this big service in the backyard. And this morning, the thing's on my front porch. <laughs> and this. <laughs> so his zombie cat arrived back on his front porch. <laughs> Clean. Isn't it weird, funny, when we try to hide something we've done? They usually catch up to us, and you're usually really awkwardly. It's the old example of the kid getting his hand caught in a cookie jar. I'm not doing it. What do you mean? I'm not doing it. I didn't do this. This is not my hand. You can't see it. <laughs> and as adults, you know, we're the same way. Whenever we cheat the system or people or work or whatever it is, no matter how well we've covered our tracks, we always walk around with this pit of nervousness in our stomachs of are they going to find out. For some of us, it's not putting in the full 40 hours of, week, of work a week, but we filled out the time card like we did. We didn't leave at 3.30. We were there till 4. When we go to do our taxes, uh, I probably don't deserve this deduction, but they'll never know. The government assistance, yeah, I think I qualify for that, that, and that. They'll never figure it out. It's a big government. They don't know what's going on. Or it's talking to people on Facebook you shouldn't be talking to. No one's going to find out. My wife will never know. My spouse will never know. My partner will never know. Just a side note, never is it appropriate at any point in your marriage or relationship to be talking to an ex-boyfriend or girlfriend, no matter what is happening in their life. It is improper and is not necessary. It is wrong. And then there's, you know, the times that we're sneaking away looking at porn. We're gossiping about our friends. Or we're cheating as students or on our work. Tenth grade, I'm doing math. I'm awful at math. I'm terrible at it. I failed two tests. I'm not going to fail that third test. Our teacher leaves the room in the middle of a test. I do not know why he left. All I know is he left, and my response was, all right, answer to number four, answer to number five, number six, number seven, number eight. And I was really bad. I didn't show my work. I just wrote the answer. <laughs> all my, my work was wrong, but my answer was right. A few days later, my dad calls me into the room and says, hey, Aaron, your teacher says you cheated on your math test. And I'd been nervous for a few days. Did I get away with it? Did I get away with it? Did I get away with it? And then my dad asked, and I said, no, I did not cheat. I cannot believe that guy is accusing me of cheating, Dad. He's lying to you. My dad, I'd build up a reputation with him, said, all right, then I'm going down to the school. And he promptly went down to the school, started to raise Cain, and the teacher said, I can prove to you he cheated, and here's how he cheated. That was a long week in my life. <laughs> it did not go well for me. Um, I did not pass math. <laughs> but the bigger problem was my teacher lost trust in me. My friends did because they got caught because I got caught. And I lost my dad's trust for a long time. So I was, my word became dirt. We have to be careful when we do things wrongly that make us nervous and uneasy because we're always wondering, when's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? So the Bible says, walk with integrity. A dictionary defines integrity as two things. One, the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles and being moral uprightness. So 
honest, having strong moral principles, and walking with moral uprightness. The second thing it says is the state of being whole or undivided. As Christians, it's really important to recognize that second one, that as Christ is in us, we are supposed to live under his moral guidelines, his principles, and when we act against that, we are a house divided, and a house divided cannot stand. So integrity says, I walk with moral principles, I walk with moral uprightness, I am unified with Christ, I am not walking around divided. When you do that, it instills confidence in you, and it instills confidence with everyone you meet, and everyone you work with, and you start to gain favor. We all want more favor with those around us. We need to walk with a little more integrity and give our name, give some confidence, because doors begin to open when people think they can trust us and they can gain confidence in who we are. And an, unestimate, an underestimated point of that is God's able to free, is freed up to bless you now because you've started acting like he's in charge. And he, did, and he no longer needs you to cheat to get ahead because he doesn't need you involved at all. All he needs you to do is follow the guidelines he's given. A good name instills confidence. Number two on your sheet, a good name speaks for you. A good name speaks for you. As you write, you can listen to a few verses from 2 Chronicles chapter 9. We've all heard, or if you haven't heard, there was this king. His name was Solomon. He's been described as the most wise man who's ever lived. You're going to hear more about him in a few weeks. But he's really wise, and everyone knows it. And far away in a distant land, the queen of Sheba hears about his fame. It says in 2 Chronicles 9, when the queen of Sheba heard of Solomon's fame, she came to Jerusalem to test him with hard questions. She came to Solomon and talked to him about everything she had on her mind. She came and said everything that was on her mind. And as the men know, 39 years later, she finished talking about what was on her mind, and Solomon got to answer. I got half the room going, he's dead, and the other half going, that's kind of funny. But after some time, Solomon was able to answer, and she said to the king, the report I heard in my own country about your achievements and about your wisdom is true. But I did not believe what they said until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half the greatness of your wisdom was told to me. You exceeded the report I'd heard. I'd heard about you, and I had to come meet you. Your name spoke of your greatness, and then I met you, and it wasn't even close. Have you ever met someone in your life before you've ever met them? You've heard enough stories about them. You've heard enough good things or bad things from those around you. When your friend says, hey, let's go hang out with Jenny tonight, you're like, I don't want to hang out with Jenny. You told me she's this, 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 this. and That's not the type of people, oh, no, 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 Jenny's fine. Or just go hang out with Jenny. Yeah, great, I've always wanted to meet her. She sounds so sweet and great. Your name speaks for you well before people meet you. Sometimes we think my name tells people my character, but your character tells people your name. You are what you are, not what you say you are. That, that phrase, well, I'm this and I'm that, and I'm like, no, really, you're not, drove me nuts when I was younger. So I made a determination in my life that I wasn't going to say I was something, I was going to be something. So for many years in my apartment, I, when I lived on my own, on my door, before I left, there was a sign that said, be it today. For me, I knew what that it was, and it was constantly an evolution of what I felt God was calling me to be. But my, I wanted, the last thing I thought before I left my house was, don't say it, don't tell people, be it today. So what is the it for you? What has God called you to be? What is he making you to be? What do you want to be? And I'm telling you, don't say you're it. Be it. And your name will tell other people about you. And it will carry the weight for you so you don't have to explain it to people. They will know you and know that you're it before they ever meet you. Point number three. A good name inspires others. A good name inspires others. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. He's writing, he says, follow my example 
as I follow the example of Christ. Be inspired by what I'm saying and I'm doing and who I am because I'm taking my inspiration from Christ and I'm trying to make my life an inspiration for you to follow along with me. Paul says, you know me, so follow me. You've seen and heard of me. Know me, follow me, and we'll follow Christ together. Be inspiring. There are people in your world that you're meant to inspire, and it's your job and it's your responsibility to do it. But some of you are asking, but who am I? I'm no one special. I have got great accomplishments. I'm not famous. I've never won any big awards. I have to be someone to do something, right? So who won the Miss America contest in 2010? Any idea? Nope. All right, let's try Super Bowl in 2002. The MVP? Trust me, I think I have an idea. I haven't looked it up all week because I've been trying to think if I could think of it. And I have an idea, but not for sure. Who won Best Actress in 2011? Not sure, right? All of these great accomplishments, and just a few short years later, we can't remember any of them. But let me ask you this question. Who was the teacher that motivated you the most when you were in school? Who was the coach that inspired you to be better? Who was the person that first showed you Jesus? We all know those names. And guess what? Des, I don't know yours. Jim, I don't know yours. And you don't know mine. Anybody know Pastor Alan Yaden? He's a, he was a pastor around town here, and now he's a pastor in Boise. That was my youth pastor when I was a kid. He helped me through some really tough times. He was the youth pastor that led services where I accepted Jesus into my life, and I made some promises. He's the one that directed our camps that inspired us to seek Holy Spirit, and I got my calling at 13 years old, and he's the one that showed me how to be a youth pastor, and I always wanted to be more like him. And years later, I still see what he's up to. And he inspires me, but none of you know who he is, but you now feel the effects of somebody else's inspiration. Because, because what he inspired me to be, I hope to inspire you to do something so you can inspire someone else. Your name should inspire people. Many of you have sat here through this whole message and you've thought, you know, this is a good message, but it's just not for me. I'm really not a good person. I'm not perfect. I'm not really, I, I'm not deserving. You don't know where I grew up. I was born in the wrong side of town, the wrong status, economic status. I was born in the wrong race. This just isn't for me in today's society. But having a good name does not require you to be perfect. It requires that you allow yourself to be perfected by the one who is perfect. That you're willing to let him take some control and mold in you. A good name is much easier to understand when you realize the name you were given at birth is not the same name you have once you've met Jesus and you've accepted him as Lord as your life. You become different. He gives you a new identity, a new name, and your story is new. Let me show you in the Bible how this works. We've all heard of some famous name changes. We all know Abram. His name in Hebrew means an exalted father. That's a really good name to have, right? But God says, I need you to do something, so I'm changing your name to Abraham, which now means father of many nations. He was good as an exalted father. Now he's great and better as a father of many nations. God says, you've done this. Now we've got to change your name so you can do this. His wife's name was Sarai. Now it's Sarah, because Sarai couldn't have kids. Sarah could. Jacob, who is a descendant, fights and deceives everyone he comes in contact with his whole life. And finally God says, enough. No more Jacob. I now call you Israel. And the line comes through you. I change your path and I change your name to identify it. In Saul in the New Testament. We know who Saul is. Saul is the guy running around saying, all you Christians are bad because you're against the law. Jesus isn't real. You shouldn't listen to him. And he meets Jesus on a road. And Jesus says, oh, you're done being Saul. Now I call you Paul. And you will be my apostle around the world and you'll have the biggest impact of any apostle. I'm going to do something different, so your reputation as Saul cannot continue. i got to start you new. My favorite one in researching was Peter. Peter wasn't Peter when God met, or Jesus met him. His name was Simon. And Jesus looked at Simon, and he said, you look like a rock to me. I'm going to call you rock. 
That's what Peter means. So why did he call him a rock? Because you're going to be firm, stable, something I can build on. You're going to be the center. You're going to be the rock of my, of my church. Now, if you've heard the stories of Peter as serving Jesus, he was a hothead. He was emotional. He chopped a guy's ear off. He rebuked Jesus one time and said, no, that's not what you're going to do. He, he kind of ran his mouth a lot. He was an emotional. He was passionate. He was a loud mouth. He was not a rock. So you can imagine before he met Jesus, he was even more so. He was an emotional hothead. And Jesus goes, I know what you are, but I see what I made you to be. And I see what I'm going to make you. And so I don't call you what you were. I call you rock. John 15, 15, Jesus says, I no longer call you servants because servants don't know what his master's business is. Instead, I've called you friends. What you were is no longer good enough. Now I give you new name, new title, because I give you new position. You get where God says a new name gets a new position, a new start? He moves the weight of the past, and he makes us a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, and new life has begun. Read it this way. The old name is gone. The new name has begun. You may still be called Stephanie, but Stephanie ain't Stephanie anymore. Stephanie is a new Stephanie. And I'm here to tell you, you're not who you were. You're who Christ made you. The struggles you've had with the good name is because you're going around living up to who you were and not living on who God is making you and made you to be. You're basing everything off what was, not what is. And Jesus is saying, that's not what I call you anymore. That's not what I call you. You're not that anymore. Come on, there's better. You can choose better. I told you they used to call me Spike, right? Fourth, fifth, sixth grade. I had a friend of mine who was really close to me in fourth and fifth grade. We lost contact. We went to different schools. I run into him in like eighth grade. And I'd gone back to the name Aaron. Everyone calls me Aaron except this guy. Hey, Spike, how's it going? By then it was kind of awkward. And I realized how silly it was. But I was like, sorry, man, my name's Aaron. I wasn't mean. He wasn't mean anything bad. He'd only known me as Spike. He didn't know Aaron. So over some time, he got to know Aaron, and my name stopped being Spike. It started to be Aaron. In the same way, you're like, well, they only know me as this, or they only know me as that. So be who God's made you to be. They're going to catch up. Don't worry about what them are. They'll eventually hear what you have to say. They'll catch your new name, and they're going to catch some God along with it. He's made you a new creation with a new heart, a new mind, new hope, New desires, new values, new principles. You are new. New. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver and gold. To be a new creation is better, is more desirable than great riches. To be the new thing I've made you is better than silver and gold. We just got to start taking on to it. We've got to take the old name and let go so we can pick up the new name. Tell them, oh, I'm this, I'm this. I can't, I can't, I can't reach it. You got to let go so you can pick up the new name. Better. There is better. Good is good. Better is so much better. And that's, that's the call today. Choose better. Live to the name. Instill confidence in others. Let it speak for you. And let it inspire other people. And let them see God through you and through you. When they hear your name, man, that girl met God, and she is totally different. I, I just love being around her. It just excites me when I'm around her. It excites me when I get to meet him. It excites me like, hey, you've got to come meet my friend because he used to be this guy, now he's this guy, and I don't quite get it, but I want you to meet this guy. We all are born with that capacity. You've all been given that capacity. And for some of you who are like, well, I just don't know. Well, today's the day to start fresh. So as they play the music and we finish, we're going to give ourselves a chance to push the reset button on our name. And I want to pray for you that this is a moment where you can say, okay, God, I'm ready to let go of the old me and pick up the new me that you've created me to be. I want my name to be new. I want my name to be 
great. So I can make your name even greater. Because that's the whole point. Who we are isn't about looking about how great we are. That's why it says it's better. A good name is, is, is better than silver and gold about what we have and what we, people think about us. It's because we get to tell people about Jesus through who and what we are. And that's what we're called to be. So as everyone would close their eyes, and if that's you, and you're like, you know what? Jesus, you're my Lord, but I haven't fully grasped everything you have for me. This morning, I want to I grasp and be the new you. Would you just raise your hand so we can pray together, saying, God, I want to be that new me with that new identity. Dear Jesus, you see the hands that are raised around the room and the people who want it, but are a little, little shy. That's okay. You, they see you, you see them. So God, I pray right now that you instill in them the confidence to be the new them. That they understand without a shadow of a doubt who you've made them to be and you see them as a new creation with a new identity. That you've called them to live a life that speaks to others about you. That just by being them, it tells other people about Jesus. So God, as we ask for this new start, God, I ask that you reach out from heaven and you push the reset button on their hearts and on their minds and you say, today is the day you see everything I have. And for some of you being in this room, you may have said, I don't know Jesus is my Savior, but I want to be better. I want to be new. If that's you, would you just say this prayer where you are intently as everyone else in the room does so you feel more comfortable? Dear Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. Forgive me of all of my sins. Guide me and lead me and show me the way. Make me a new creation with a new identity. I give you my life and I give you control. In Jesus' name, everyone says amen. And that's all it is. It's just a prayer that starts new. Now, go from here. Don't live like the old you that walked in here. Live with the new, better name. The, the good name. And I want to bless you as we go and pray. Father, thank you for all the marvelous things you have done today. Thank you for your love that you have revealed to us and for the love that we share together as a community. We pray that all the words that you have sown into people's hearts today, I pray that you watch over them, protect them. May they take root and produce wonderful things, things of beauty, of great blessing to many. And as we leave this place now, thank you that you walk with us. May, you open, may we be open to your voice and hear your promptings and live in your endless love. Yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory in this age and for eternity. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May, his, may the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you